Yeah, yeah, yeah. Familia, amigos, welcome to the second episode of Regenerative Culture Podcasts by Collective Wave with your host, Yoshi Pantera. We're so excited today because we have a special guest all the way from Ecuador, from Yunguilla, close to Cuenca. So his name is Wilson Ochoa Ramirez. How you doing, Wilson? I'm doing wonderful, man. Thank you again deeply for the invitation. I'm very glad and honored to, to share a word, to say, share my, my experience here with you guys. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So Wilson has 32 years old from Cuenca, Ecuador, completed his studies in clinical psychology, a master's degree in neuroscience at the Vrije University, Amsterdam. He did his graduation thesis at Harvard University in Boston. He's a certified yoga teacher by the Yoga Alliance, a musician, educator, lecturer. Wilson is the founder and director of the amazing Inti Kamari Holistic Center for Human Development located in Ecuador and an active member of regenerative networks such as Casa Ecuador and the Global Eco Village Network. Wilson has been working as a motivator, educator, and speaker for more than a decade. He has given workshops to more than a thousand national and international people in just the last two years. Wilson and his family constantly receive organizations, companies, students, youth and adults in Inti Kamari Holistic Center. He travels with regularly to other cities, communities, and countries to teach his distinguished and unique comprehensive self-awareness workshops. Thank you very much again, Wilson, for being here. And first of all, I wanna let everyone know that we know each other for a few years already. We have participated together in workshops, festivals, uh, in order to create transform transformational experiences for other uh, individuals and groups. So it's a pleasure to have been working with him and also uh, I've been very inspired to his knowledge and energy that allows me personally to find out more about myself and really bring out that potential I have inside of me. And I'm sure he does it with others. So that's why I'm inviting Wilson today in order to learn a little bit about what he's doing. And first of all, I wanna start by really understanding Wilson, how did you get involved with neuroscience and psychology? What made you go through this path and, and what drives you to, to study so much and do this action every day? So mm. let's start with the first question. What motivated you to get into psychology and neuroscience? Thank you, Yoshi. How beautiful to hear your questions. Also, thank you so much for all the presentation so of course, it sounds always so much more beautiful when somebody else uh, brings it over. So thank you for that. And I'm indeed so happy to know that uh, the way we met was in this background and this common ground that you were creating with, uh, with your wife and uh, in which I was so amazed that we had so many things in common and how beautiful it is to know that since then we've been connected and um, I, ju I just, I'm super happy with what's going on. So related to your question, uh, I do have a very specific answer to that, actually, because it was almost like those kind of situations that when you fall in love, like first time with something. And uh, I was about, I was 15 or 16 years old. And um, as a teenage, uh, I, my, my parents wanted to bring one of my brothers to a retreat. It was a retreat called the Enneagram. And my brother didn't want to go. And the girl I liked the most around that time in my neighborhood, she was going to that retreat. So I was like, what? I, I want to go to that retreat. I didn't know what the retreat was about, but I wanted to go because of her. I never had a thing with her uh, at all, but I did go to this retreat and I was shocked. I was shocked. It was my first encounter ever in my life with a theory of mind. It was about the Enneagram. I don't know how much you know about the Enneagram, but um, after I've, I've studied a little bit about, uh, you know, psychology and neurosciences and spirituality, the Enneagram is perhaps the oldest theory about the personality that exists in the whole world. We don't even know where it came from. Most people think it was created by the Sufis, by the Sufism. And the guys that were guiding that retreat were so eloquent and so wise. 
that as a teenager, I was looking at all these experiences and all this theory, and I was like, how, how, how is it even possible that somebody knows so much about the mind? And I was so amazed by that. It touched me so deeply. Um, and I, I must say also that before that, I was very naturally curious about, you know, why are we the way we are? I was always with my friends talking about patterns, like, you know, yeah, that happened to Pedro and he misses his girlfriend too, and I had it too. And, you know, all these little patterns were always fascinating to me. So when I found this retreat, I was like, oh, I want to know more about this. I don't know how, but I want to know more about this. So I started a path through it. A uh, little after I went to that retreat, I was so hungry of this knowledge that I uh, happened to come across that the wife of the facilitator guiding that retreat, she was a spiritual teacher of a line of uh, meditation called the magic of love, la magia del amor. I followed that spirituality path for four years of my life uh, till Victoria, that was my spiritual teacher, she died. She was a very wonderful, wise woman. And she introduced me to all this. So little after that, I, of course, wanted to study psychology. I wanted to study more about meditation. And it never ended. It just never ended. Till the day I, every time I keep finding people like you or programs or books, I keep being hungry. I keep wanting to know at least something more from which I could help one or two persons throughout my life, which, of course, every year that passes ends up being more than hundreds of people every year. And I'm every day I'm more inspired what I do, brother. No doubt. Wow, thank you so much. Interesting. And I imagine that through this curiosity, you end up in Amsterdam. Why why Amsterdam? What happened there? Again, just a coincidence. When I was 18, you know, here in Ecuador, particularly in Cuenca, it's very common that once you finish high school, your parents would send you somewhere with an exchanging student organization. And I wanted to go to Europe, particularly to Italy, but there, there was no room. So I was like, okay, where, where should I go? And the people from the change student organization were like, oh, there's a spot in the Netherlands. Do you want to go there? I was like, I don't know a thing about the Netherlands, but all right, if you want to send me there, I'll go there. So I went to the Netherlands when I was 18. I had a beautiful experience over there with a Dutch family in a very small town. And um, I, I returned to Ecuador. I started clinical psychology. And as I was studying clinical psychology and spirituality meditation, there was always a little bit of a question to me about, you know, spirituality sometimes can go a little bit too mystical and too um, idealistic in a way. And for many people, especially for me, I'm a very practical person too. So I was like, I want to know the basis. I want to have something in which I can call some substance. I want to know where, if there's such a thing as the soul or the mind, where is it located? So I was always very curious about neurosciences. I love documentary when documentaries, when neuroscientists will come and share words. And I was like, how can I get to, to do that? How can I get to experience with those machines and, you know, electrodes and magnetic resonance? And, you know, one day I just made a shot. I just wanted it so bad that I just started to research. And I found out that the Netherlands was coincidentally one of the best places in the world to study neurosciences. So I Great. speak... I thought that would help. So I just started to apply and all the doors just opened up and I ended up going to Amsterdam and, and do my master's research there. Yeah. That's how I ended there. Great, great. So, so for some of us that don't understand very well neuroscience, what what's the difference with psychology okay yeah. yeah 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 that's a wonderful question actually because you know there are actually two very specific lines of study and one is called neuropsychology and one is called neurosciences and there is a little bit of a big difference in between both so let's say neuropsychology in psychology in itself it would focus much more often in our relational patterns, in our emotional patterns, in our psychological patterns. While neurosciences wouldn't necessarily only focus on the mind, but neurosciences would also focus in general in the body. So for example, think it that way. When you study neuroscience, you also may fully focus on a neuron, on an axon of a neuron. You would focus also in the nerves that go through the body. So very often neuroscientists 
bring out knowledge about the mind and about the body that would be very helpful for physicians, for doctors, for psychiatrists, for neurologists. So to say, neuroscientists are the ones that create, um, that they research about how the brain works in all terms. And from neuroscientists, psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, brain our mental realm mm -hmm. and so talking about regenerative culture and today with you with neuroscience and psychology how do we understand regenerative culture if we're in a degenerative culture right now so i believe that psychology and and our mindset in general and our spirituality is one of our first steps in order to understand a regenerative culture for the future. So uh, just, you know, a, a phrase from uh, Gandhi is like, if we want to see the, the world to be better, it starts within ourselves. Yeah. And what's the first thing that we can start within ourselves is what's yeah. accessible to us. And it's, mm. uh, it's our mind, our way of thinking, our patterns, our habits. So during your studies, what would you see is the first part of our existence in our brain and in our psychology where we have to be working with? Thank you so much for the question. I, I so much value the question you're making because, uh, you know, Yoshi, you and I, we've been talking often about um, gathering to create communities that are the startup of our re regenerative culture, right? And uh, that's the closest we got to start communities where, where, where we try to bring up a different culture. That's all about. Perhaps eventually we may spread that out. And there's one thing about communities that I've, at least in the last 10 years I've been coming across, is that, you know, once we create, create uh, communities, sustainable communities, um, eco technologies work good. Permaculture techniques work good. We can even create economical models that are alternative to the ones we have, and they work good. You know what doesn't work so good? The community. The social realm of the communities is usually the path that is usually the leg that falls down. And we may have wonderful molens, wonderful solar panels, wonderful gardens, wonderful everything. But then eventually the same virus that always brings us down as a culture has to do with our social relationships and our relationship to ourselves. And I've been seeing this so often, once and once again, that for me, every year that passes, Yoshi, I'm completely certain that the key point that we have to tackle if we want to make communities in regenerative cultures work is we have to truly focus on making each one of us be fully responsible and resourceful in the way we work and align ourselves. And also, we have to work a lot in how do we create bridges between us as brothers, sisters, and community that work long term. So if you would ask me, yeah, absolutely. I think we have to fully focus on at least a few points that can be helpful in communities. I will bring out, to not make it too long and extend, I will bring about two specific points. For example, in terms of social relationship, I think you may have noticed, for example, Yoshi, that most uh, mature communities is starting up something in the world. They will never leave out Nonviolent communication as an intrinsic part of a community. If you research about most communities, they will make workshops. They will train almost every single person in a community in nonviolent communication in order to try to create a new culture that can work long term. And then I can mention something more related to the individual part. So you will notice that most rare regenerative cultures and communities nowadays they will try to have at least a little bit of some type of meditation and self-care practices that help us, each one of us, to be emotionally uh, in balance. So we are, you know, we are as a musical instrument, Yoshi. I don't know if you play guitar or ukulele or whatever, but I am a musician. And something I come across every single day in my life is that my guitar gets out of tune, man. Every day it gets out of tune. I've been wondering for years why nobody creates a, a machine that holds 
the strings in a way that you don't have to tune it ever again, but it doesn't exist. We have to tune the guitar every day again. Like my guitar gets out of tune because of the temperature. It's too hot, it's too cold. It gets out of tune because I play it too often. It gets out of tune because I don't play it. So it just gets out of tune. And the only thing I can get out of that is I have to tune up my guitar every day if I want to sing in tune. And you know, the reason why I bring this metaphor out is because such a thing happens with our person every single day. We have to learn to tune ourselves up every day because we will get out of tune within 24 hours. So how to do that in order not to have an emotionally charged person within a community every day that just brings everything out of order. We have to create a spaces within a regenerative culture in which we learn with practical ways how to balance, our, balance ourselves and get in our centers and how to bring wonderful uh, practices of communication and social relationship within the members of every community if we wanna make these new proposals work. I don't know, I don't, that's what it comes to my heart right on. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I feel is that if the mind has a has ability to be in tune every day, what is it that makes it be tuned? What, what is it that we have to do and how does it that happen? Okay. Maybe yeah. it's too deep. No question. I, I could answer that from different parts, but you mentioned before in the question, what could neurosciences and psychology say about this? So I mentioned one thing, we could talk for hours, you know, Yoshi, but I mentioned one thing that comes from neurosciences and it's called the default mode network. The default mode network is kind of the scientific uh, term that we use now to explain the wandering mind. What is the wandering mind? The wandering mind is what we call sometimes the crazy voice of the house, is that egotic mind that never stops talking. And actually, the most of the things that talk this wandering mind are things that are not necessarily positive, are not necessarily one wonderful things. Usually the wandering mind, which most spirituality traditions try to talk about and bring us ideas of how to put it in place, the wandering mind usually keeps thinking about the past. So remembering things that happened in the past, regrets, pain, something that I, I don't know. And also keeps planning again uh, towards the future. So this wandering mind is always worried about something that happens in the past or something that may happen in the future. In, in, a, in a nutshell to say it would mean that the wandering mind would never like to be in the present. Most of spirituality traditions and today's science too would suggest that a mind that is focused in the present usually is a much more healthy mind, is a much more focused mind, is a much more successful mind, is a much more effective mind for business, for your home, for your personal life. So we come in this point in which we can say easily that if we would learn techniques to try to keep our minds the most present and focused as possible, the most um, uh, mindfulness practice that a person can do, the more balanced a person could be because also you're not wasting energy. So, you know, our brain doesn't have an infinite amount of energy and every thought we use, it use energy. So how to keep our energy for the things we really want to do, that's, for example, a wonderful path to try to practice. And we have different resources and techniques to try to do this from science, from psychology, and from spirituality. Doesn't matter where it comes from. It, it helps us to be much more in the present and use our energy effectively and our focus effectively. I think that's, for example, one very clear and practical element that we can talk that could be useful for any person to try to put in practice these, these, these elements. In meditation. With meditation, with mindfulness meditation, with even certain practices that have to do with dancing. When you're dancing, and you're fully focused, you may not have a chance to be thinking. If you're doing certain types of sports, could be also martial arts, doesn't matter. If you find any activity that brings you down to be fully focused and present, that will give you joy, that will train your body, that will train your mind, and will make you a person that would be much more easily happy and, and plenty. Great. Talk to me a little bit about Intikamari and how the space 
creates what you're talking about. Thank you so much. So Inti Kamari, uh, we opened Inti Kamari about four years ago. Uh, when I say we, I mean me and my family. Um, right now, actually, most of my family has moved over there. This is a small valley outside a big city uh, in Ecuador. It's a subtropical valley. And what we, what we wanted to create in Inti Kamari were three basic things, right? One was to create a uh, permaculture agroecological farm in which we could teach about eco-technology, sustainability, and ways to live in harmony uh, with our beautiful Mother Earth um, and ways to share that, especially with cities. We try to focus ourselves to be a transition place in which we don't try to take people out of the city to a jungle, for example. We try to create a transitional place in which most people of the city, which are not ready to fully move into nature, they could find our valley and our proposal as a transitional place to, to try to recreate that in their homes. Um, also, we wanted to create Inti Camari as a place to promote educational, holistic education about everything that could make us be better persons. So we are a constant um, place where we organize retreats, workshops, conferences, and so on about all topics as possible, mainly focused on developing our physical realm, our emotional realm, mental realm, and spiritual realm, social realm in the most effective way as possible. So we organize meditation retreats, yoga retreats, neuroscience retreats, humanistic and gestalt psychology retreats, bioconstruction, permaculture retreats, art retreats, you know, everything that goes in that line of what usually doesn't get thought in school and universities. So we wanted to create a space in our city and our country in which people that is looking out for those um, topics that they could find it there in a beautiful place surrounded by nature where you can learn much more than just that topic, but also feel in a family space. So of course, we also promote our regenerative culture and we feel that for one of the most beautiful things to try to teach is, you know, try to take back those family virtues. You know what people say in the medicine ceremonies and shamanic paths, we are all family. We are all a big, big family. We are the great family. So what better way to teach that that starting with the most, with the smallest path. So being family, doing this with a family, trying to take care of those very delicate relationships because living with your father and your mother might be one of the most difficult things you may ever wanna do. But if you learn to do that, you may be able to lead your life in a much more effective and powerful way. For the Western society, living with your family is one of the things you never wanna do. You wanna kick that out of your life. But that is not true for all societies. When you go into indigenous societies, indigenous communities from the highlands, from the Andes, from the jungles of Ecuador, Yoshi, you know, man, you've been working with them. There's one thing that is a path there, continuity. You do it with your family. You give continuity to your grandpa, to your mama, to your ancestors. You don't discontinue that because if you do that, you lose memory. And if you lose memory, you may lose it all. Some people say that Napoleon, you know, in Italy would have never lost the war he did if he would have read a little bit more of history. He would have known that another army lost the war in the same winter there. If he would have known, he would never have tried that war. If we keep in continuity with our ancestors and our family, we have a certain power. We've been noticing that, Yoshi, a lot of foreign foreigner brothers and sisters, they've been coming to Ecuador and to South America to try to remember themselves of those beautiful feelings that you have when you're able to grow in a family. I believe communities is a second step of a family. So if we take that back and we share that through our center, I thought it would be possible to try to remind that to many brothers and sisters. And I don't know, I thought that was a good start. Yes, thank you. So the the opportunity to do experiences in, in Inti Kamari in the space uh what what is the most challenging experience for you as a neuroscientist psychologist that you encounter in these um, gatherings ceremonies or in, or before Inti Kamari like throughout your life like and your what is what have you seen in this uh, pattern thank you so much thank you for the question you know, how funny, my answer might be very close to what I answered before about what, what is the value of neuroscience and psychology in regenerative cultures. 
The thing I've been dealing with the most, most often as a problem in Inti Camari and before in my life were social relationships. Not my social relationships, man. I'm usually a good person and I've been learning how to relate myself in very pacific and efficient ways with people. Um, but for example, during the last during the last two years, we've been receiving about 120 volunteers within two years. We ended up having at points about 18 volunteers at the same time, 24 volunteers at the same time. A beautiful big table. It was gorgeous, Josh. It was beautiful. People from all over the world, Ukraine, the States, Canada, Brazil. It was beautiful. We were planting a lot. We were having beautiful times, but then we were having a little bit of the of this social conflict within them. Very, very ridiculous social conflict. You know, hey, don't put the music so loud. Hey, I don't want to eat granola every single day. I would love to eat some eggs once in a while. Hey, dudes, we're eating too late. What about if we start eating at 5.30? I don't feel hungry at 5.30. Hey, don't talk to me that way. Hey, in my country, we don't listen this way. You get my point, right? Cultures from all over the place living in the most peaceful realm that you could create for them. Little by little, they will start having little conflicts. And you know, in Inti Kamari, we ended up having two circles of work that week, one on Mondays and one on Fridays. We were having every single day practices or meditation or something to try to bring things down. We had one conflict resolution group at week to try to resolve conflicts that we have we were having normally. And you know, even this was possible and the community was walking beautiful, but I was trained. Up. I actually am not receiving volunteers at the moment because I needed a break. It wasn't possible for me to hold this by my own. I would love to do it again, but I want to do it with more brothers and sisters. I want to have a team in which we can lead the, 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 you know, the conflict resolution group. One week me, one week you, Yoshi, one week Paula. Um, not one person all the time. It's too much. Energetically, it was draining. But it's so necessary. And now I don't have volunteers anymore, but my team. So I have a team, you know, cookers, people that take care of the garden. And, you know, we get the same things that you see out there in society. Once in a while, somebody gossips a little bit about the other. Once in a while, somebody's envious about the other. The rest, Yoshi, works perfectly. You know, the retreats, the organization, the marketing, the communication, the garden, all works beautifully. The thing we have to tackle every single week is social relationships. Therefore, once in a while, every week, somebody of my team comes over and is like, I just don't feel good today because I just had a fight with my husband. And, you know, I, you know, and I have to listen to them. And if I don't do that, they're an emotional bomb that spreads out and not so good energy to the rest of the team. So, yeah, what's a constant work, emotional and social real? Mm -hmm. Same old story. Same old story that creates the war around the planet. We don't know how to take care of ourselves as a family, as brothers. Sometimes take it out of the world with our own family. Sometimes with our parents, it's unconceivable to live together. And I understand that with some brothers and sisters because, you know, I'm a fortunate guy. My parents are relatively easy going. Not therefore completely easy, but in comparison to other families that I've been giving company to, some parents are not to live with, simply not, simply not. So yeah, it's a big work we have to do in our, in that realm, Josh. Mm -hmm. Awesome, uh, thanks for sharing. So my interesting question that I got <laughs> is in order to help accelerate the process, I've been hearing that different types of medicine help us waken up towards uh, a self-realization and a transition to a more conscious mind or how would you describe that in the best way? Like, what do you think about alternative medicine as a, a path or treatment for the social relationships that we have and our limited mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that, you're making such a wonderful question. Thank you so much for that, Josh. Uh, I, 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 have, I, have a, I have a little bit of a broad view about uh, medicine. I think we're talking about sacred medicine, right? 
about, you know, medicines are very common in our country. For example, our country in comparison to many others in the world uh, carries three of the most common medicine plants on, on earth, you know, San Pedro, which means mescaline, similar to peyote. We have ayahuasca, which carries DMT, which is a very known uh, molecule around the world itself. And also we have very interesting types of mushroom, with psilocybin is also one of the main focus molecule, which we resemble, for example, uh, LSD as a creative medicine. I do believe, and I am, a, I, you know, I've been receiving and being part of a medicine ceremony since like a little bit more than 10 years ago, and we received medicine ceremonies in Inti Kamari too. Um, I do believe that sacred medicine plants can help to accelerate the process of our work we have to do, no doubt. I do have two considerations on it. The first one is I do believe that we have to take them with great responsibility and which that I mean in the right place with the right people guiding those spaces. And also um, it's very important that we create sharing circles after these experiences. I've been encountering many people sharing medicine uh, in my surroundings which they will fully trust that if you give medicine to this person, the medicine will do all the work, send them back home and let's hope it works good. Sometimes it does. Uh, I do believe that it's much more effective if we make sure that we bring a space, a sharing circle, perhaps one more than one in which we can share our experiences and be able to kind of bring down key messages of that that we can actually digest. Otherwise, sometimes it may stay a little bit too much in the in the highlands of our mind. And then it's not so helpful. And my second consideration goes in the same line of this. I think we have to be careful um, with the frequency and the amount of medicine that we may wanna take. And this applies to any type of medicine, you know, plant medicine, conventional allopathic medicine, if you want to. You know, uh, an aspirin for a headache might be very good for me if I have a headache. But if I don't have a headache and if I keep taking aspirins, I may get sick again, you see? And uh, I think that is one of the things that is starting to happen with medicine nowadays, that some people that doesn't, you know, taking medicine is like going up with an elevator to, to a conscious space where we can get knowledge and wisdom to work in our lives. And it's good to go up there, take that wisdom, go down here and apply it. And only go up there again once you have applied what you've learned. If you don't do that, if you keep taking that elevator up there, there starts to happen a numbing experience in which the medicine that used to be medicine can start to become a little bit of a poison. And that's what I've been seeing, Josh. So I've been encountering many communities that keep taking medicine as a common path too often and eventually starts to fragment their minds too and it starts to create social difficulties again. Um, I don't know if you follow much of Terence McKenna's words when he was alive, but I want, I love one of his, one of his beautiful poetic sentence. And he says, once you, once you have received the message, you can hang up the phone. In the words of Carl Gustav Jung, the humanistic psychology, he says, please don't open more, more rooms of the, uh, collective unconscious that what you can digest. Don't open more, just open enough. Because just sometimes we have enough work to do with our emotional uh, difficulties in this realm. And if we haven't taken that into our hands, open another floor might be too much. For me, a very interesting and simple metaphor to this is don't buy more food than what you can eat in what can fit in your refrigerator. And I think that happens a lot with the astral world, with the mind world. We should take just enough. And then it's very helpful for a community. If we make it a constant path, it might turn the other way around. That's what I've been seeing. I don't know. Maybe some people may think differently and that's very respectful. Mm -hmm. uh, listening to you, I started thinking also, what causes our mindsets to be having these emotional problems or um, limits. And of course it's the society and the history and um, different things like 
culture key and whatnot. However, I believe if this doesn't happen, our life gets a little bit boring because we it feels that we need to go through the path of understanding ourselves, learn about ourselves, discover our potential. And all this process for me feels very exciting to live because if I already know all the power I have from the beginning or, or there's nothing I have to heal, it's just, uh, it, it feels that's only a, a one way path and yeah. it takes out a little bit the excitement. So it feels that even if you're a psychologist or even the doctors, I don't believe neither of us is perfect in the, that sense of having the mind that we believe is perfect, but it's already perfect that we're living the experience of transitioning from the limited mind or whatever and coming to this understanding. So all this is perfect. Yeah. Not what we think is perfect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I believe it's just, it makes me think all this thing that oh, I, I just think it's amazing that we're talking about this. It's helping me. It might help other people listening to this. But at the same time, if we were already uh, healthy, let's say, there's nothing we can do. It takes yeah. us away our, our intention of being in, our, in this world. Yeah, yeah. What a wonderful observation you're making. I, I fully agree with you. I feel the same way. And you know what comes to my mind immediately when you say that is the, um, I don't remember from where I heard that for the first time, but a spiritual teacher once said, you know, if one day humans would be able to reach that point of perfection in which everything is in order, society, their minds, their social relationships, their economics, you know what they would do? He said, they would just mess it up. As soon as they reach that perfection thing, somebody would just mess it up. Somebody would be like, okay, you know, we got to move this out. And I think it's interesting that he mentions that because when you look at the, you know, when you look at the organization of the universe, in, in every term you want to look, even in terms of the atoms, you, you see the constant dance, more than a battle, a constant dance between chaos and order. So such a point that as soon as something becomes organized, it immediately reaches a threshold in which it just disorganized to start all over again. And this is such an interesting thing because it seems for some um, traditional spiritual schools and so on and esoteric schools that this is uh, apparently the pattern of the evolution of the consciousness. You see, we seem to be doing this all the time. We come out of the, of the primary consciousness where everything is in order and we start a path a st a start a part of evolution in which everything is very disorganized to a point, then we start to go from the mineral realm to the vegetal realm, to the animal realm, to the human realm, to the, to the consciousness realm, to the angels realm, till we get back to the primary point. We go back home. And once we get back home, it seems that it, everything starts all over again. That's why some people brings up this concept about the, you know, the, the sacred for. For, for, for forgetfulness would be that the word the sacred the sacred forgetting you know it seems that we're all we're all a piece of god you may easily say we're all god we're all a point in which god can open their eyes through us and uh, it seems that one god wants to forget its own game and that's the fun part it makes me think i like to think uh you know uh, of life as a as a school but also as a game and when life is a game Remember when you were a kid and you were playing this, your favorite game and you just passed all the stages and one, one day you just ended, you finish. And you're like, oh man, how much I would like to play it again. You can do, but then it's a little bit boring because you know what, what, where the monster is gonna come from, what the difficulties are, so it's not fun anymore. How funny it would be if you could just forget it. If you just could forget it and start all over again. Now imagine if God likes to do that. God just loves to forget and start all over again and pretend that nothing is going on. But these are not my words. Eh? Some people in the Bhagavad Gita, which is kind of the Bible of the Hindus, um, they say that Krishna, which is God, 
he would come down once in a while. And, you know, he would have a family. He would have his mother. And he would even like to make his mother be angry. And he would like to be, you know, punished by his mother, even though he was God. It was God itself. It was Krishna itself. So I don't know. I don't know if this answers to your view, but I, you know, I do believe that at the end, life never starts being an evolutional, evolutionary process. It even comes to my mind this sentence of a salsa song, which I like a lot, in which they say, you know, once I knew all the answers, they changed all the questions. And this is a, a very wonderful sentence of one of these favorite salsa songs. And I think, you know, this, this thing we're talking about has been there in our human culture for millennia, and it will keep being that way. We will keep learning. We will keep wanting to, to learn. Even when we know it all, we will look for more. Understood. Thank you. So I have a couple more questions before we go. So listening to all this, I connected to the ego. We talked a little bit about that, but how would you describe what is ego? Like, what's the first thing we can identify ourselves as an ego? Mm. There's positive and negative ego, mm. I believe. So can you describe that a little bit? Absolutely. I would love to. I think the most interesting question about being my question too, because I came across the concept of the ego before I started studying clinical psychology. And that was an interesting contrast, you see, because once you study the ego from psychology, they will call the ego your personality, temperament. They will call that as your identity. They don't call it the, your ego. And for psychology, the personality doesn't necessarily is a bad thing at all. But from a, from a lot of spirituality perspectives, the ego is something we want to kind of um, detach from. We want to put the ego in its place. And, you know, we are much more than our ego. We're our consciousness. The ego is kind of limited to our brain. The ego will be defined very often as a construction of memories that goes growing as we grow from, you know, from infancy to adults. So it's, you know, usually people would say your ego is kind of just a mixture of memories, ideas, and concepts of everyone that has been around your life. From that point of view, Anthony de Mello, a spiritual teacher, would say we are we're we're beings of second, we're secondhand beings because nothing we say, nothing we think, nothing we do is new. All of that has been done by someone before of us. So the ego, from that point of view, is kind of this construction that is not really ours, and it can incarcerate ourselves. Uh, now, I I would like to propose a much more a much more flexible view of the ego because sometimes when you try to, you know, from when you try to take off your ego from your life, from your mind, from everything, you start battling against. It. You're like, oh, that was my ego. I don't want to be my ego. Oh, that was your ego. Stop talking from your ego. I should take my ego out and be fully beautifully silent. And you know, the more you battle towards things, it seems that you never get there. You know, that's why they say, you know, uh, rather than battling against your enemy, become friends. When I would like to come in terms. One of the most beautiful explanations of an ego that I've ever heard came from a guy called Alejandro Spachenberg, a guy from Uruguay. And he would make this beautiful metaphor and he would say, try to think of, 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 a, of your consciousness and your being as a cell, as a normal cell, typical cell you see in biology. Now think of the ego as the membrane of a cell. So he would say our ego is the only chance we have to interact as a consciousness to interact with the world. We don't have any other chance to interact with the world than by a membrane that we use. And he would say, you know, every, every cell has a membrane and how healthy a cell is depends on how permeable or impermeable this cell is. Now think about this. There are three types of cells, right? You have three types of membranes. You have permeable membranes, so membranes that can let anything in, anything out. You have non-permeable membranes, which means cells that have very like membranes, they don't let anything out from them, and they also don't take anything from the context. They don't think take anything from the atmosphere. 
And then you have a three type of membrane, which is the semi-permeable membrane. Alejandro would say a very healthy ego is a semi-permeable ego. So an ego that is able to interact a little bit with the world and take some things from the world, but not everything. If an ego is too permeable and everything from the outside world comes in my head, I can get crazy, man. That's what we call in psychology a psychosis. When I cannot differentiate my thoughts from the thoughts from the outer world. So I just hear something I think is mine. I think that voice in my head was mine. Then you have the neurotics, the neuroticism, which means when somebody becomes impermeable. So an ego that is like, I'm, I'm who I am, this is my identity, and I will never change. This is who I am, and I would be this forever. That's too strict. That's too square-minded. You see, that person is not interacting with the others. He's not receiving new ideas. That's not healthy. What is healthy? A flexible ego. An ego that is aware that we have an ego, and we play with it. We try to make it a flexible pattern. We try to take our temperament and make it something that is functional. We receive ideas from an outside world, but we choose which ones come in. We also give to the outside world, but we don't give everything. We give just enough. And I think if you would ask me, I think the best part we could try to take with our egos is to become friends with it and try to tame it as we tame a horse in order to walk with it through life in a, in a functional way, while being aware that we are much more than our ego. Great, great. So I understand a lot better that because for a long time, I did that. I was away from my ego for a long time and I was really hard on myself. Yeah. And I learned a lot for sure. I let go of many things that wasn't letting me grow and, and learn. But then I also felt limited. I didn't have as much relationships. I started to realize that I needed to have more impulse with myself, kind of Kind of bring back my ego and say, "Yeah, I can do this. I can, mm. I can put myself out there." Like right now with the podcast. Before I didn't want to come out on the camera or be on microphone because I felt it wasn't about me. It was about what I was doing, and I had to take away myself from what I wanted to do. It was yeah. about what I'm doing, not about who I am. Yeah. So it was I took stream of taking my out my ego yeah so lately i've been learning that i need to have a, a balance and take a little bit from each one a little more ego sometimes a little less ego sometimes and yeah. and that's it ego is myself and i always exist so yeah without that great healthy ego i wouldn't be able to grow yeah so that that understanding is good because yeah. For a long time, I was confused, and I think many people can be confused about that it was bad. Yeah. And so that's important yeah. to know. Yeah. Yeah. So right now, I really thank you for sharing all this information. And I wish we can go longer. We can probably do an upper ep episode. But to end, like, I would like to know what what would you recommend to the youth or maybe elders how, of how to transition or what action can they take in order to understand more the ego or heal the emotions or, or mm. pass that limit mind that we have? Mm. Uh, what would you recommend we can do? Mm. Oof. That's, a, that's a big question. I, I would love to try to put in like in one or two words. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the end, the best we can try to do is to try to truly realize that working and cultivating our consciousness, our words, our communication, our mind, our emotional um, sustainability, our social relationships, our nutrition, our body, Taking care of that is the most essential, perhaps. There's nothing more essential than that. Cultivate that as something, you know, people like to go to the gym and they think that's important. People like to study and, 
and create a professional uh, career in their lives that they think that's important, surely is important. But there might, there might be nothing as important as having a profession, having a family, having friends, having a work, having a, a farm. But having all that while being an integral person, a healthy person. If you're not a healthy person, you can have $10,000 million and you will fuck it up with it. Sorry for, for that, if it's the right place for it. But there's not other way to say it. You know, I love this sentence that says, um, you, if a person is so intelligent to be able to even uh, divide the atom, which is the most, the smallest particle on earth, there's been people that has been able to divide the atom of how intelligent they were. But if they don't have love in their hearts, they will create a bump. That's what they create. And that's what happens with, with this world that we're going to. We're so smart nowadays. We're able to create uh, skyrockets that go to the moon. We've been able to create the smartphones that can solve everything, all types of problems and questions we have. We've been able to create so many things. And then yet we keep struggling with the same old thing that we're unable to use those tools, to use that technology, to use our capacity with love. So I would say my best recommendation to any person would be really take self-development and spiritual and personal cultivation as, as the most important thing you can follow in your life. And you can find so many things to do with that. It start by anything you want. It start by learning some breathing techniques, mindfulness, start by starting meditating, any type of meditation you like. It start by taking care of your nutrition, if that's the part you're being called by right now. Uh, it start by taking care of your body, doing some, it start by farming. Go to the garden and just plant some things. You will realize that your energy will get renewed. Your magnetic state that you get lost by with your phones, it will get renewed by working on the on nature. It's time by working with communication. Take a course on nonviolent communication. You will, you will nurture your relationship with your parents, with your couples, with your partners. I would say explore any path. If possible, all of those paths are your own rhythm that would help you have a wonderful luggage of tools and resources to try to be a light in this world, to try to be a life-giving sun to everyone that is around you, to shine, to be warm to others, to help regenerate this wonderful world and the souls and the hearts that we have around. I would say, take that as the purpose we have as a species. Truly, Yoshi, if you would ask me, what is that we're, we're supposed to do down here in Earth? If you'd ask me for a purely, um, biological perspective, what is the human species to be done in this world? What is it? Everyone has a function. Bees have a function. Wolves have a function. Birds have a function. What is our purely physical bi biological uh, function down here, man? And I, I have my answer. I don't know if this is the, the answer for everyone, but I used to ask myself since I was a very young kid, what am I supposed to do down here? Why does the bee knows what it has to do and I don't? And nobody tells me, you know, I believe we're down here to regenerate. That's what we're down here to do. If we were able, like think of the earth as a, as a cell. If we were able to be the gods of that cell and be like, what does this cell need? If I were able to do that without my own body, if I were be able to create a cell that is so intelligent, so capable, so smart to do stuff, what would I send that cell within my body to do, Yoshi? probably I would send that cell to heal because how else would I do that? I would send an intelligent cell to be able to go through my body and every part and be like, oh, there's something wrong there. I will take care of it. Oh, there's some cells that are having harm. I will help them and heal them. Now, you know, there's not other species in this world at all that is so smart at us to be able to take care of all the other animals if we would want to. As a little kid that brings a little chicken back home and says like, mom, mom, the chicken has a broken wing. Can we help it? That's our function. We could be friends of all animals if we want. We are the only species on earth that can plant in the earth vegetables and trees consciously. Birds also do, but they do it unconsciously when they poop. We can plant trees because we see that some, I don't know, some animals need it. We're able to see a river that got broken and he's not bringing water to the wolves and cows down there and be like, mm, that river, there's something wrong with it. Let's put it good. 
we are the only animals with intelligence enough to see our world, world feel part of it and be like, you know, we can help to remain the order of this beautiful land. That's our function. And I believe as everything in life, we've been doing exactly the opposite till the day. And now people like you and I in all these networks, we're starting to realize that nothing has been so far from the truth that what we've been doing, we have just to go to the other side and start to truly accomplish the function, which is the opposite because this is a polarity. This is a dual world. Our function is the opposite of what we've been doing. So it means we are the healers. We are the engineers. We are the regenerative cells. We are like the white blood cells of our body. The ones that take care and help. We are the immune system of our, of our mama. And we can do that work. So I would say, I don't know, if we could connect with that and start to train ourselves with every tool we can to actually accomplish our function as a biological cell of this mother earth, I think we would live so much more happily and joyful and knowing that we have a sense of purpose in this world. We have something to do and we can do it. We have all tools to do it. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, amigos, familia, like you heard, we got Wilson Ochoa today. We have learned different perspectives of understanding of psychology and neuroscience. And we're taking away the fact that we can reach different services and spaces that allow us to learn more about ourselves, to understand our mind, our body, the spiritual world, and how to tap into that understanding our maximum potential and really focusing towards future generations. The understanding of regenerative culture is starts with ourselves. How to focus on decisions and actions that create conditions for more life to exist. So observing ourselves from, from within our habits our decisions in our daily lives, are they part of a degenerative culture or a, or a regenerative culture? Mm. Are we healing ourselves and being regenerative in our life or the habits and decisions that we're doing are degenerating ourselves? So it's a good way to observe this, a good way to talk about this and yeah, we wanna hear what you think about this conversation today. If you have any questions, let us know. We're gonna drop out some links below about Inti Kamari, Wilson Ochoa and what he's doing. Shoot him a message, shoot me a message at Regenerative Culture Podcast, collectivewave.org. And yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'll see you soon. Gracias. Thank you, Josh. What a wonderful space. Thank you so much for, for this wonderful space. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm.